Today, let's take a quick look at my 1935 Underwood Noiseless Typewriter. I'd like to start by saying that in no way, shape, or form am I an expert on antique typewriters like this. I just happen to find them aesthetically pleasing. And I won't own a typewriter that doesn't work. So just to let you know, this one works flawlessly. I've had it refurbished. And I will leave a couple links below to people who actually are experts in this type of thing and to the person who rehabbed this one. Let's start by loading some paper in this thing and I'll kind of show you how it works. Keep in mind that the paper that I'm using is copy paper and not actual typewriter paper. So that makes a huge difference. I'm of the old school and this is how I was taught to line up paper to make sure that all your lines are straight and that your lines don't go up or downhill. So as you can see, everything's straight. The trick to typing on an old typewriter like this is to type with purpose. You need to commit to each keystroke. It takes a lot of practice to actually get good at it. And I have no idea how people can type quickly on these things. You have to have patience. But if you do have that patience, it's well worth the experience. And as you can see here, the backspace could probably be a little bit smoother, as well as the forward space but that requires tuning that I don't have the expertise to complete. And we'll quickly type out another line here. And as you'll be able to see, if I was using real quality typewriter paper, these letters would be crisp and clean and not faded or blotchy as they appear on copy paper. People also find it surprising that there's a lever on the front of some of these old typewriters that allow them to type in different colors. If you've got the right type of ribbon, this one has a setting for white, so I could actually go back and white out words if I wanted to. But as you can see here, it also types in red. The layout for the keys on this Underwood Noiseless is exactly the same as you would see today with the QWERTY style key set. The keys are kind of close together, so it always helped to have very small, nimble fingers to be able to make accurate keystrokes when using one of these things in a professional environment. Here's a quick look at the ribbon spools. These are not original. The originals on this were lost and have been replaced with a later model electric ribbons. I also do not have the ribbon covers. On each end of the platen, you have these sliding devices here. These are called paper fingers. These on this particular model are in absolutely terrible shape. The metal's in good shape, but the little rubber roller there is flattened on one side. And it should be replaced. I just don't have, again, the expertise to do that or the equipment to do that. So I kind of just usually just slide them out of the way and don't use them at all. They're not 100% necessary. I mentioned that this is a 1935, and the easiest way to determine that is by the serial number, which is located right here and you can easily look it up online. We'll take a look under the hood to remove it. It's a simple matter of taking these four screws out, two in the front, two back here, remove those. It comes off pretty easily. Let's get that done. And with the hood off, we'll be able to see the inner workings. Let me kind of get that straight, there we go. See the inner workings of each of the individual bars for the letters that correspond with the correct keys. Now, just to let anybody know, I am not going to strike these against a platen with no paper. I'm just kind of moving them slowly forward so that you can see how this operates and how the ribbon adjusts as the strikers move forward. And I make that disclaimer because you never want to strike on a typewriter that doesn't have paper on the platen or jam up the keys. As you'll see, people have done millions of times at any antique store or flea market you've ever gone to, they're all jammed up, and that's the reason why. As you can see, the platen adjusts when I hit the shift key there, and that's basically how it works. And we'll go ahead and put the cover back on, and in case you were wondering, this is all that makes it noiseless. So just having this cover and that one little pad there was considered 
state-of-the-art noiseless technology in 1935. We'll slip this cover back in place, then I'll move the typewriter to a different location, and we'll take another look around it. When I was moving this thing, it struck me that you might want to know how much it weighs, and there you go. 43 pounds. For this look, we'll start at the back of the typewriter, where you can see the maker insignia, where it was made in Hartford, Connecticut, USA. Because of the way the case is designed, there's not much to see, but what you can see here is the knot there in the center of the screen, and that attaches to the carriage return ribbon. It's vital that that tension is set correctly so that the carriage returns accurately. Taking a look at the left side of the typewriter, not a whole lot to see. When I originally got this, it had fingernail polish all over this side of the typewriter, and luckily I was able to clean that up without damaging the black finish here. On the right side here, we have some controls as well. The bottom one is for manual ribbon progression. You simply spin it and it advances the ribbon. And the top dial there is an adjustment for how hard the letter arms strike the platen. Tipping this thing up on its back, you can see underneath the setup of all the different bars and springs. And it's really a wonder how someone was able to engineer something like this and make it work so absolutely flawlessly and accurately when it's well tuned. And here's a close up of some of those springs so you can kind of get a better idea. And from this perspective, you can see the carriage return ribbon on this side, and then the end of the line bell on the other side. Lastly, when I got this thing, the feet on it were completely dry rotted, and I was able to replace them with simple rubber stoppers that I found at the hardware store that were the perfect size and the perfect height. Just drilled a hole right down the center for the screws, attached them, worked perfectly. So that's it. That's a brief walk around of my 1935 Underwood noiseless typewriter. I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be holding on to this thing with a move coming up. It's very heavy, as you saw, and it takes up a lot of space. But fear not, true believers, if I do decide to get rid of it, it will go to a good, loving, and respectful home. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. There's a place below for all that kind of stuff. And maybe, just maybe, I'll see you on the next video. If you enjoy videos about the randomness of our amazing world, consider clicking on the globe to subscribe, or maybe checking out one of the other videos right here.